from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering InterConnect 2017. Brought to you by IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Las Vegas for IBM InterConnect 2017. This is theCUBE coverage of their cloud and big data event, uh, Watson Analytics and IoT Cloud. It's theCUBE coverage for three days. A lot of great interviews. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Scott Francis, an entrepreneur CEO, co-founder of BP3. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, glad great to be Great to have here. an entrepreneur on because you've been, in your business you co-founded it, built it from, from the ground up. Right. Hundreds of employees now, over 100 employees. Right. Uh, IBM partner, great story. Yeah, we started with just two of us 10 years ago and we'll have our 10th anniversary in May this year, so. Congratulations, uh, so take yeah. us through the you know, state of the art. I mean, go back 10 years ago, you would actually provision yeah. your own servers. You actually had to load routers and networking gear. That's right. a, I'd say a tax of at least 100K in just gear. And then you got the yeah. ISP char, all that stuff. Right, well the economics have totally changed, right? For us and for our customers, and I think the main benefit is you can get to business value so much faster now and spend less money that's sort of wasted spend, right? So take a minute to talk about what you guys do and yeah. what your role is here, and then I want to get into some of the the things that are changing the marketplace that people are seizing opportunities around, certainly around process and, on, and new innovations. So give us a quick update on who you guys are and, and your role here today. Yeah, so our, our focus is on business process and decision management. And you know, our experience is that it is foundational technology and foundational uh, aspect to almost everything you're hearing going on, right? Whether it's blockchain or cognitive or moving to the cloud, what are the key considerations? How does it impact my business process? How does it impact my operations? How does it impact my decisions? So we feel like in our space, we're right at the sweet spot of what all of our customers are worried about. And when we hear them talk about blockchain, we know we've got a process problem we've got to address. Yeah, when we hear them a, talk about moving to the cloud, <laughs> well, we better address all of the Halo applications around that application that's moving to the cloud, make sure they're all addressed and part of the new business process. It's interesting, the whole decoupling of, mm -hmm. of existing systems, models, right. is really kind of what I see as the macro trend over the past six years. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, foundational building yeah. blocks is key, right? So that's right. key. And so let's, go, let's take this to the next level. I want to ask you a question, because I think this is something we see all the time mm -hmm. on theCUBE when we do interviews, is that technology now is so much different. In the old days it was, we knew the process, right. and we don't really know the technology. Let's go automate that, accounting, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You know, we right. saw that, ERP, CRM, all those vendors. Mm -hmm. Now it's, I have technology, I don't know what the process is going to be, because right. some new big data analytics will change the insight and change a value chain, or change a business model, some one tweak, Right. radically will disrupt proven process, which no one right. wants to change. Whoa, you know, so there's right. now a re real factor. Yeah. What, give us some insight and color around how that goes down, because someone has an insight, they want to roll it in and implement it, right. it changes the entire process flow. Right, well the key thing is, having an insight as a single person in a process is one issue, but rolling it out across a Fortune 500 company is a whole other proposition, right? You've got regulatory issues and compliance issues and customer experience issues that you've got to work through. Uh, all those accommodations may be there, the, the value prop may be there, but you've got to work through it. You yeah. can't, you know, at a, at a billion dollar organization, you can't just change it, you know, for the heck of it, right? You have to work through So what's the playbook? Out. Yeah, so the playbook is when we have an insight, um, you know, what we talk to customers about is, You've, you've got all these tools now to arrive at insights you couldn't get to before, or by the time you got to them, you're doing your analytics over data that's six months old. Okay, now I have an insight about what would have worked six months ago. The difference is with cognitive and yeah. machine learning algorithms and the analytics you have available today and the access to the data, those insights are available now. So we have to re-architect the processes to reflect that and to let me make new decisions within that operational context. The so, data Good. Operationalizing those insights. Go ahead, right. finish your thought. The data, well, the data first thing that you mm -hmm. talked about is key, yeah. and we just had our, our big data event in Silicon Valley when conjunction with Strata Hadoop was, data in motion and batch are working together now, to your point, right. the time series of data is relevant in the time you need it, right? right. Not yesterday. So this brings up the question of, okay, mm -hmm. you got some Spark thing going on, I see IBM's yeah. got Spark, that's cool, but now how do you get it into the app, mm -hmm. right, to developers? Right. I'm a developer, mm -hmm. I'm a coder, do I need to be a wrangler, data wrangler, or a data scientist to make that happen? So this is the conversation that people are trying to figure out. Right. What's your perspective well, on that? I think a lot of the tools that are, that are available now basically make a, a common coder, right, has a decent chance at competing with their data scientist friends. There's a different level of expertise, obviously, for the data scientist. Yeah. But much like uh, in business process, you know, years ago, you had to get your Lean Six 
black belt, and you had to really study it to get good at it and really master statistics. Now you've got tools that will run the statistics for you, right? So you don't have to master the statistics, but you've got to collect the right data, you have to engage yeah. in the business. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think you see a sort of democratization of data science, right, with the tools that are available now. So talk a little bit more about um, decision management. You yeah. know, go back to the mid-2000s and the Harvard Business Review is writing articles mm -hmm. that gut feel trumps, you know, uh, paralysis, uh, analysis, uh, paralysis mm -hmm. by analysis every time. Right. Um, that's seemingly changed, mm -hmm. but what specifically has changed in regards to operationalizing those insights? Well, I think there, there are a couple things that are interesting. If you, if you look at how processes were traditionally designed, you know, before BPM came along, or the BPM and decision management tools came along, you just write the code, build your application, and then when you wanted to change the decision, well, you had to find where that was modeled in the code, and edit the code, right? And that was a challenging proposition. The guys who wrote it might have moved on to other projects. So how do you figure it out? So gut feel was yeah. faster. And BPM and ODM gave us tools for managing those things. BPM in terms of process, having a diagram that a mere mortal can understand and find the right context for where that decision gets made. And decision management to manage rule sets and the interactions between these rules in a more codified way that, um, again, mere mortals can understand, right? So you don't have to go hunting through code. You're looking at a, a model, a representative model. I think the, the change now with uh, machine learning, with cognitive computing, the real-time access to data, is that you have to really rethink your processes and allow those decisions to be altered in real-time, not later, six months later, when I'm doing a revamp of the process as a separate sort of institutional operation, but actually as I'm running my process, we design it to accom accommodate the idea that as we're collecting data, we're going to learn and get better and actually affect those decisions, or recommend a different decision to the person who's Johnny on the spot. Are you finding that the business impact is mm -hmm. that your customers, the consumers of this new sort of new way of doing decision management right. are seeing things that they wouldn't have seen before, or is mm -hmm. it more greater conviction and faster time to everybody pull in the same direction? Right. Well, I, I think for sure they're seeing things they haven't seen before. Uh, it's sur we're surfacing data that they just didn't have access to before in a timely fashion and in the context of their process, which was always a difficult thing to do in traditional systems, right? If you're running your you know, traditional ERP or CRM system, the notion of what, where you are in your cross-functional process may not be present. But uh, today, you have that context, you have the real-time access to it. That really changes the nature of what you're seeing. Um, I think the other bit is, yeah, the actionability, right? How, how easy is it to turn that insight into an action? And have you seen any effect mm -hmm. on the politics of decision making? Because we all yeah. know, you know, the P&L manager, who's the, the strong right. voice in the organization, yeah. he or she's going to pull data that supports their business case. Um, right. ha have you been able to sort of neutralize that sometimes mm -hmm. damaging effect in organizations? Yeah, well, I think, I think in the cycle of the economic cycle, uh, you know, if you rewind five or six years ago, almost every project we engaged with with a customer was about operational controls, reducing cost, trying to produce the same result with fewer resources, right? Um, and that has shifted dramatically over the last few years. The last two years, it's been almost entirely about capturing revenue. Opportunistic, right? yeah. Serving new revenue streams with, without having to hire as much to support it, right? And so it's, it's much more about revenue capture and customer experience. And I think that reflects the stage we are in the cycle. <laughs> Is that a bubble reflects, indicator? <laughs> I, you know, I hope it reflects a good long-term yeah, I hope so view. too. <laughs> um, you know, but it's interesting, there's a, uh, there's a customer speaking here at Interconnect today, uh, StubHub, about their customer experience. And they use BPM to manage their customer experience. And back in 2009, 2010, when everybody was pulling back and they were all focused on cost containment, you know, I recall StubHub was working on how to make their customer experience better. It's kind of interesting, right? And, and they've done very well over the years, right? So I think, I think that value system, that culture, really pays off over time, but you have to really mean it. If you're just swinging back and forth with the ebb and flow of the economy, then I think it's very difficult. Well, to, if you're doubling down when everybody else is sitting on their hands, you're right. going to get a competitive it's a great opportunity, right? right? Yeah. You know. So talk a little bit more about the IBM connection. What's going on at Interconnect? And What's the yeah. relationship there? Well, IBM is our best partner. Uh, you know, we've been partnered uh, very closely with IBM ever since they acquired Lombardi, which was our uh, uh, company that we came out of back in 2007. And that has become you know, the heart of the IBM BPM portfolio. And we work with their business process products, decision management, as well as Cognitive and Bluemix. So we're, we're in the mix with IBM in a big way, and I, I think this conference is a great opportunity for us to not only reconnect with folks from IBM, but also with our customers who tend to come to this conference as well. So it's a great 
great opportunity. So for specifically, us. you're yeah. leveraging IBM tooling, sort of repackaging yeah, right. that in your solutions. Right, so clients. we are a reseller, we also OEM, IBM software, and we do delivery work for IBM customers. So that's a, kind of the trifecta. So you so. started this company 10 years ago. Tell right. it, we love this startup story, <laughs> so tell us, you and your colleagues started, tell us that's your startup story and how you got right. to where you are now. Well, we were, you know, we would meet up at a coffee shop, right, and get together and kind of talk about you know, the fact that it felt like there was a big opportunity out there. This is to, in Austin. Yeah, in Austin. Um, my co-founder and I, you know, we were working at Lombardi, but we felt like there was an opportunity to build a great services firm in our space, right, in this business process space, that there was a lot of untapped potential. And as we met and talked about it, we just got the bug that we needed to go out and do it. And uh, when we started the company, you know, it was just the two of us initially, we bootstrapped the firm. Uh, last summer, for the first time, we actually raised money, outside capital, to help Ten years fund in. the growth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but all that time we self-funded, right? And uh, which was a great experience. I mean, a great learning experience. Certainly uh, lost some sleep over the years. Um, but you know, there was an aspect of kind of putting the band back together. You know, hiring people we really enjoyed working with and previous lives, previous uh, jobs, and putting together a killer team to go after it. So the decision to take outside mm -hmm. capital. Yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about that because that's the, probably wasn't an easy one, or maybe it was. I don't yeah. know. But no, I think you know. What we've been fortunate to do is we've taken some you know, calculated risks over, over time, right? We, we used to only operate in the United States. We acquired a business in London to expand to Europe. Uh, and now you know, a third of our business is in Europe. But those risks, you, know, you, you can put the whole company at risk taking a, a chance like that. And, and so it occurred to us, you know, that after taking a few of those calculated risks and winning, that maybe we should hedge our bets a little bit and have some, some more capital to work with and have a good financial partner that if we were engaged in that kind of discussion, someone who could help uh, both advise and also possibly fund if we got into that situation. And so we, we uh, took an investment from Petra Capital based out of Nashville, they're a great growth equity firm, and they invest in healthcare and tech startups like ourselves. Um, and so we got some great, I think great people on the board as a result. Um, Mike Simmons from T2 uh, Systems and uh, Jeff Rich from, uh, well, it's from another capital investment firm, and uh, these guys have been operators, right? They've run companies much bigger than ours, but they've also been in the mix at our size. So we've got some great, I think, outcomes out of taking that investment. So you've been cash flow positive since the early yeah, days, since right. day one you had to be. Is it a plan exactly. to continue to do that, or you do, do you make sort of you know, yeah. gasoline in the fire type investments? I, you know, I think it's cultural, right? I, I know there's a lot of business models where there's some there's actually some good sense in the running and not worrying about profit for a while, but I also think you develop habits, and in our business, serving enterprise customers, I think they deserve to know that we're being responsible with our money, with how we spend, with how we grow, and that we have a responsible level of growth. We could spend more and grow faster uh, at the sacrifice of profits. At the risk of, profits, of service, But too. at the risk of service quality yeah. for our customers, and that's not worth yeah. it for us, because yeah. ultimately, it's the repeat business with customers that really drives our growth long term. Yeah, we so, feel the same way, obviously yeah. self-funded. You know, I would say, you know, in Silicon Valley there's a story like the mm -hmm. hierarchy of entrepreneurs and right. it's, it's well known that the number one position is self-funded growth without, without outside yeah. capital. It's a lot harder, no offense yeah. to my VC-funded friends. <laughs> it's a lot harder to do it from the ground up yeah. than just get other people's money. So tier one is do it yourself, mm -hmm. which you guys are in. Get some capital, grow that, and have an exit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three, try and fail. Or four, work for a company. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, and I think the uh, you know, it's harder. It, I think the key thing is it takes patience. You yeah. know, if you're going to do it yourself and self-fund it, yeah. you know, let the business fund itself, not just throw in your own personal money, but actually make the business fund itself. You have to have a lot of patience to stick with it. And I think, whether by hook or crook, we we picked a space that afforded us some of that patience. Yeah, right? and you get uh, rewarded for innovation. You get rewarded for good service delivery. Right. Well, and we feel like business is a human endeavor, right? So good business process and good decisions yeah. are going to be problems that our children will face, yeah. not just us. And they're going to get more exciting for you as processes get automated with machine learning and AI right, right here on the doorstep and DevOps exploding yeah. with IoT coming on, on, on full line. It's going well, to change the game big time. Yeah, and I can't remember who said it, but someone uh, just yesterday was say, saying, uh, you know, it's not so much about uh, automation as it is about augmentation. And I really think that's true. I think if you automate out all the mundane, what's left is the stuff that's really interesting, right? And uh, they, you know, that's kind of how we view our job, is to automate all the stuff that's getting in the way of highly skilled people doing their job, taking care of their customers. I cool. always love the story when IBM Supercomputer beat Gary Kasparov at chess, you've heard this yeah. a million times. Right, Kasparov didn't just say, all right, we're done, he's created a competition and he beat the computer. And now right. the greatest chess player in the world 
is a combination of human and machine. So right. it's that creativity and that, that right. combinatorial and that blend factor is actually better than the machine innovation. only, right? right. Yeah. The creativity is going to change the game. Scott Francis, entrepreneur, founder, and CEO, co-founder, and CEO of B. Uh, P3 in Austin. Thanks for joining us, appreciate yeah. it. More live coverage here, stay with us. The Cube is at IBM Interconnect here in Las Vegas. More great interviews after this short break. <laughs>